Assalamu alaikum everyone. I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you to Catalyst Labs for inviting me. And you all have been very happy that you have come to me. My talk is going to be divided into two parts. For the first part, I'll talk a little bit about the importance of storytelling, why it matters, how to do it, and how it permeates everything we do. The second part of my speech will focus on women and culture. If you think my things are a little controversial, or radical, or my body is a type of my body, then listen to the end and remember the name of the conference, Disrupt. I was told to deliver my speech in English, so I'll do that, but I'll also be leaning on Urdu here and there. So, why tell stories? Why are stories important? Our need for narrative goes back 2,000 years. At its heart, Telling a story is an act of creation. It is an act of self-authorization and of agency. Telling your own story is a defiance of the conditioned ways in which you've been taught to think. We've been so trained to think along particular lines, to think of ourselves along the lines that society sees us, that telling your own story becomes an act of radical autonomy. What do you think politics is? The political party you support, and I'm staying away from the nitty-gritty of that today, you support it because you believe the story it is telling about yourself, the world, your values. Look at everyone sitting around you. Everyone has a belief system. Everyone has a political vision they support. In other words, everyone has a narrative they believe about the state of the world. Which brings me to the theme of entrepreneurship. The single best trait of an entrepreneur is someone who can tell, frankly, a compelling story. Investors have a short attention span. They'll give you the most attention at the start of your pitch. Make it count. Steve Jobs, the late CEO of Apple, was as successful as he was because he understood that design was as important as product. They go hand in hand. He made a beautiful product and disrupted the assumptions of the tech industry. Folks thought functionality was all, and it is important. But aesthetics, the way in which we tell a story, is equally important. Steve and Apple's head designer understood, for example, the value of packaging. His colleague recounts, Stephen and I spend a lot of time on packaging. I love the process of unpacking something. You design a whole ritual of unpacking to make the product feel special. Packaging can be theater. In other words, try to the best of your abilities to marry form, the way in which you tell a story, and content, the substance of the product. Try to tell a successful story. So, why do I write and act? What does it do for me? The painter John Cage has a quote that I want to share with you. He says about the artistic process, when you start working, everybody is in your studio. The past, your friends, enemies, the art world, and above all, your own ideas. All are there. But then, as you continue painting, they start leaving, one by one, and you are left completely alone. Then, if you are lucky, even you leave. I love the last line, then, if you are lucky, even you leave. You become so immersed in the work, so thoroughly at one with it, that the rational, interfering, actively processing part of your brain takes a back seat. You enter into a flow state. Are there any runners in the crowd? Yes? No? There are? Cool. So you've gone on a long run. There comes a point, if you do it regularly, that you forget how or in which way your limbs are moving. You enter into a flow state. Your mind drifts, your heart expands, your legs keep moving but you're not actively monitoring the mechanics of the way in which your body is moving. When I'm writing and the writing is going well, I forget to eat or drink for hours. Someone has to pull me away from the computer and tell me to re-enter life. When that happens, I know the writing is going well. This brings me to the second part of my speech. What stories are we telling ourselves culturally these days in Pakistan? As some of you may or may not know, I'm interested in the conversation around women and the extent to which our choices are dictated by those around us. 
I'm interested in the spaces we occupy, the spaces we are excluded from, and the conversations around our freedom and autonomy. One of the things I've noticed that happens everywhere in the world, not just in Pakistan, is that women are defined by the roles we play in the lives of the men close to us. When a woman is sexually abused or harassed, people hold up placards that say, she's someone's wife, sister, mother, daughter. So my question is, is a woman only a relationship? کیا عورت ہونے کا مطلب یہ ہے کہ چونکہ آپ کسی کی بیوی یا بیٹی ہیں آپ اس لیے معاشرے میں اہمیت رکھتی ہیں لیکن یہ ہمیں بچپن سے سمجھایا جاتا ہے ہمیں بچپن سے سمجھایا جاتا ہے کہ پورے معاشرے کی غیرت ایک عورت کے جسم میں ہے پورے معاشرے کی غیرت خواتین پر ڈپینڈ کرتی ہے بٹ ویمن آئی ایم ہیئر ٹو ٹیل یو آ کوائٹ سیک اینڈ ٹائرڈ آف بینگ کنٹرولڈ ان دس وے We are tired of our bodies being the battleground on which male honor is contested. One of the ways in which society curtails and restricts women's freedom is to tell them that they're letting men down, rejecting the roles that they have assigned us, the quiet, submissive wife, the dutiful daughter, the wife who sacrifices her own dreams at the altar of her husband's ambition. Misogyny ka naam hi ye hai, to enforce social roles. As the philosopher Kate Mann, whose work I really admire and highly recommend you guys should read it, says, she says, misogyny is not a matter of psychological ill health. It is a facet of social power relations. Misogyny, she says, can be thought of as the law enforcement branch of patriarchy. Women are supposed to give feminine coded goods and services such as attention, affection, sympathy, social, emotional, and reproductive labor. Men are supposed to take masculine-coded perks and privileges such as power, prestige, reputation, and money. When a woman begins to take masculine-coded goods and services, there's immediate suspicion. Why is she disrupting her role as a maternal, affection-giving thing? The logic works in this particular way not because she's not thought to be a person, but because her personhood is held to be owed to others in the form of service, labor, love, and loyalty. In case you haven't noticed, women go to great lengths to avoid disrupting social situations in which their behavior is culturally scripted because they're worried of a problem. They're worried of being cast aside. It's one of the reasons why I show up at Aurat March every year. Just think of it. Aurat March happens once a year and a national meltdown ensues because how dare we galvanize to demand change? How dare we raise our voices? How dare we challenge the status quo? In every strand and fiber and locus of power in our culture, women who are silent or passive are thought to be good, dignified, and most interestingly, innocent. This obsession with innocence is designed to trap young women into an interminable girlhood. Young women who are naive and innocent and perennially cheerful, disengaged from the seriousness of the world. So, my message to the men in the audience today. Instead of feeling threatened by women asserting themselves, refusing the roles that society has assigned us, try and become allies. Not because you vaguely want to help us, but because you realize that your welfare is inextricably wound up with ours. And if you don't agree with our choices, learn to say nonetheless that I may not agree with you, but I respect your right to have a different opinion. Thank you.